John chapter 19, beginning in verse 16. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it and put the sponge on, the, on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus was sitting on a donkey as he rode into Jerusalem. And this is such a vivid picture that the people of the city knew exactly what was happening. Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah. It had been predicted, dictated centuries earlier, that the Savior would ride into the city on a donkey. And now here was Jesus, and he meant business. The crowds cheered him on like the heavyweight champion of the world, shuffling from the locker room to the ring for the main event. He confronted the corrupt priests, he condemned the system, he silenced the foe, and he won every scripture battle he got into. He was the victor, he was the king. A new order was going to come about. And boy, does he have an agenda. Now that we've silenced the religious folks, let's get on to the real business. Let's go talk to Pilate and to Herod and eventually Caesar, because I'm sure you've got some words for them too. There's a sense of joy and anticipation and adventure as they head into the Passover feast that night. In fact, the disciples have started to argue about who is going to be the greatest in the new regime, who would have seats of power and status. And yet Jesus has a strange, pessimistic vibe about him the whole night. After dinner, they go for a walk through a local garden, and while they're there, Jesus is arrested by the same authorities that he had spent all week defeating. One of us sold him out for a six-figure bribe. In a matter of hours, Jesus had been tried, condemned, and sentenced to death. He was handed over to the occupying forces for execution on charges of treason and anarchy. The soldiers put a cross on his back and made him march a mile or so, carrying his own electric chair to a hill affectionately called the Place of the Skull, which sounds lovely. Here the soldiers batter railroad spikes through his feet and his wrist at the base of his hands. And before they raise him up and drop his cross into a post hole, they nail a sign to the cross that says, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Rome has made clear what happens to rebellious kings. They torture them to death. Well, he's not our king, say the priests, who he has been spending all week defeating. You should change it to, he claimed to be the king. Oh, but if we change it, then we're just condemning a heretic and a pauper. But as it stands, we're killing a defiant king. And that makes a far greater point. Jesus hangs there as an object of shame. 
Rome has demonstrated what happens to anybody who thinks they can pose a threat to the system. The priests have demonstrated what happens to anybody who claims to have more power than they. You think you can take away our system? Well, think again. The soldiers then strip Jesus naked as the day he was born. One of them gets his tunic, one gets his cloak, one gets his prayer shawl, another his belt and shoes, which leaves only his undergarment. And they say, well, let's not tear it. It's too nice. Instead of tearing it into four pieces, let's... Let's let the coin decide. Let's flip a coin. Let's throw dice to decide who will get it. Who will steal from Jesus? His last shred of dignity is left to chance. And Jesus hangs there naked, vulnerable, exposed, powerless, not a stitch to his name. As death edges closer, Jesus looks into the onlooking crowds, the spectators of the spectacle, and he calls attention to one of the disciples and to his own mother. And he gives them to each other to take care of. No longer will Jesus be her son. No longer will he be his disciple. But now they are together, leaving himself alone in the world. About three o'clock, the same time that the rest of the world is starting to think about another cup of coffee to get them through the last two hours of their Friday, Jesus senses that death is imminent. And for Jesus, death feels like being thirsty. The one who is the water of life is hanging there dying of thirst. The one who fills all things is empty. Maybe now, maybe now Jesus is going to call for rescue. He's done miracle after miracle after miracle. He has walked on water. He's calmed storms. He's healed people who were sick and blind. He's fed thousands of people at a time. Surely the Roman nails are not more powerful than he is. Surely the corrupt priests do not get the last laugh. When is the real Jesus going to show up? And with his final breath, Jesus says, it's all over. And he hangs his head and his body goes limp. I can't believe it. This isn't how it's supposed to end. Jesus is a disappointment. His disciples are embarrassed. They're afraid for their lives. The system of violence and oppression has won. Jesus was stronger than the storms and the sea. He was stronger than leprosy and blindness. He was stronger than hunger. But Jesus isn't stronger than Rome. He's not stronger than the priests. What started in anticipation and excitement ended in shame, nakedness, loneliness, disappointment, and death. Jesus has gone the way of all men, paying the price that all men must one day pay. And yet, and yet the disciples remove his body from the cross. They lower the corpse down, men and women together rich and poor together, educated and simple together. And together they dress his body for burial. And as they handle his cold, lifeless flesh, his words from the night before must have been ringing in their ears. This is my body given for you. Every time the disciples sit down to eat and they take bread in their hands, the words of Jesus ring in their ear, this is my body given for you. They begin to get the sense that what just happened was somehow for their benefit. The shame and nakedness and loneliness and disappointment and death, somehow it accomplished something. The real body of a real person And it accomplished something for me. And the disciples look at the cross, at the place where Jesus had taken his last breath, which had been stained by the blood of a hundred executions before him, and which is now stained by Jesus' blood. They look at his blood, which covers the blood of criminals. 
And his words from the night before ring in their ears. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Every time the disciples sit down to dinner and take a glass of wine in their hands, the words of Jesus ring in their ears. This is my blood, which is poured out for many. They begin to get the sense that his blood was not taken from him, but that it was given away. The blood that had caked his hair to his face, that had dripped to the ground, that stunk of death, was for many. For me. Real blood from a real person's wounds. And whenever they would take a sip of wine, they remembered it's not just wine in their mouth, it's human blood. And yet this blood sealed a covenant, like the the blood that seals a pact between childhood friends. It's a new deal, a new agreement, a new order, a new regime. What started in anticipation and excitement ended in shame, nakedness, loneliness, disappointment, and death. But before the blood had dried to the cross, something new was already beginning to take shape. All right, I'm in John 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Mary Magdalene. Why did she go to the tomb that morning. I've been to my own family's tomb many times. I've laid flowers on the headstone. I have washed dirt off of their names. I have sat and wept. I've sat in silence. I've asked my dead for advice. I've told them of how my life was getting along in their absence. I've prayed for mercy. I've prayed for the release of death. But perhaps more than anything else, I have tread on the graves of those I love because of the sense of presence it provides. As I kneel down on their graves, there is a sense of going back. Because we used to be together, but now they're here. And if I can go there, then we'll be back together. And in some small way, things will be how they used to be. Why did Mary Magdalene go to the tomb that morning? Certainly she walked into the cemetery garden fully expecting to see the stone in place, perhaps to feel a cool draft coming out from the crypt, perhaps even to smell the stench of Jesus' body beginning to rot. Did she go because Jesus just can't get along without a few more spices in the tomb with him? Did she go because she had nowhere else to be that morning? Did she go because she expected that in some small way, by going to the place where his body was buried, she would share in a sense of his presence? Did she go because she wanted to go back to how things were when he was alive? 
Did she want to spend just a few more minutes with him to weep at the tomb and grieve? When she arrived at the tomb, she found that the stone had been uh, moved. Can you imagine walking into a cemetery, finding the plot of where the one you love is buried, only to find the soil is overturned and the coffin and body are missing? Immediately, she runs for help. Mary, why are you so out of breath, I imagine they ask her. And she says, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where he is. I went to the tomb to be with Jesus, but he isn't there. And so the men take off running for the tomb because they want to weigh and investigate the evidence. They find the burial wrappings are still lying there. One is carefully folded and set aside. One of them is presumably confused and doubtful and hesitant, while the other man believes Jesus isn't here because he's alive. With nothing more that they can do, though, the men return home while Mary stays there in the garden. Instead of weeping over his body, now she weeps over his absence. She's come to spend some time with Jesus, but he's not here. She stoops down to look into the grave, and where the grave clothes had been, there now sit two angels. And they ask her, why are you crying? Grief? Despair? Confusion? Hope? Relief? Anger? She says, I'm crying because they've taken my Lord out of, out of the tomb, and I, and I don't know where he is. Where is Jesus? You know, that's a question that is still very much in vogue. Have you ever noticed that of the two major Christian holidays, Christmas has been absorbed by commercialism. There's gifts and decorations and meals and nativity scenes and movie releases and massive consumer spending, while Easter has been largely untouched, save for the absolutely necessary new Easter dress or some candy. But beyond that, compared to Christmas, no one wants to touch Easter. Why do Americans spend so much more on Christmas than on Easter? It's because anybody can acknowledge that Jesus was born. That's a real historical fact contested only by conspiracy theorists. Even atheists will admit that Jesus was born and that he died. Even the irreligious acknowledge that he was a good man with good ideas. I mean, look around you. It is time for magazines to start featuring an article on the historical person of Jesus or devote a whole special issue to it. It's time for TV to start uh, airing programs depicting his life. It seems like the whole world is prepared to gather at the tomb of Jesus to sing his praises and pay homage to a good man and perhaps to even weep over his untimely execution. The whole world, like Mary, enters the garden expecting to find the tomb sealed. Like Mary, we come to the tomb expecting to find it sealed and with it, the work of God. For years, she had followed her rabbi faithfully, learning at the feet of the master. And surely she was like the others, expecting that Jesus would lead a march against the powers that be and liberate Israel from under the oppressive thumb of Rome. But the dream is dead now. It's all over. Whatever Jesus was going to accomplish is already done. And so we walk into the garden thinking that whatever Jesus was going to accomplish, it's behind us. The central work of Jesus, it happened on the cross, and that's behind us. It's all over. We fix our eyes on the cross, and we proclaim nothing else matters. When he cried, it's finished, and he gave himself to die. Salvation's wondrous plan was done. Mary came expecting him to be in the tomb. I would too. The whole world does too. And now she's crying. Why is she crying? Because they've taken my Lord and I don't know where they've put him. He's not here. What do you do with that? It's the makings of a psychological thriller. At this, she turns around and she sees a man. And, and who else could he be but the undertaker, the, the groundskeeper, the gardener? Whether it was his face that was veiled or if it was just her eyes, we may never know, but she fails to grasp who he is. And he asks her, who are you looking for? Like the gardener doesn't know. Like he didn't see the breathtaking disciples coming in and out and hear the angels. 
like she hasn't seen, or like the gardener hasn't seen the tears. Come on, you know exactly who I'm looking for. Did you move him? Tell me where he is and I'll go and get him. Where is Jesus? But like a shepherd to his sheep, he calls her by name. Mary. And instantly the veil is lifted. Her eyes are opened and the truth is made clear. Jesus Christ is alive. He is alive, just as alive as you or me, with breath in his lungs and blood coursing through his veins, speaking and walking and eating and skipping rocks on the lake of Galilee. He's alive. The reason the tomb is empty is that by the hand of God, death had no power over him. The irreversible was transcended. The inevitable was put to shame. Salvation's wondrous plan was not finished. The story is not over. The world files in to pay homage to a good man, but the world goes to the wrong tomb. They steal his body and they put it in the tomb. They're mistaken as to his identity. They're baffled by the death certificate that they still hold in their hands. The world hallucinates, imagining the stone is still in place and the long rotten bones are sitting in a tomb somewhere in southern Palestine. They acknowledge Jesus was born and they mourn over the death of a good man, but of course his remains must be lying somewhere around Jerusalem because the mere thought of resurrection makes them swoon. But in fact, he's alive. Biologically, historically, personally alive. Friends, judgment has already passed. Sin has already been paid for. God has already held us accountable and condemnation has already been poured out. As the scriptures say, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. See, I am doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? Mary did not perceive it. She didn't see the truth until he called her by name. And her eyes were opened. And today he calls you by name. This morning we stand in the cool breezes of the garden, walking and talking with God. See, he is doing a new thing. Now, today, it springs up. Do you perceive it? Do you hear him calling and see him standing in front of you? Do you see resurrection happening all around you? Wherever Jesus is, resurrection is there too. And wherever there is resurrection, Jesus is there. When deception and falsehood and arrogance are put to death and truth is brought to life, when darkness is penetrated by light, when despondency and sorrow are vanquished with hope, when sin yields to repentance, when apathy and ignorance pass away and desire and compassion are born, when isolation and loneliness are swallowed up in solidarity and community. Jesus is here all around us. And this is not a metaphor. This is literally, Jesus is literally, historically, really present wherever there is resurrection. Do we not perceive it? Do we have the eyes to see? Or are we expecting to find a risen Christ? Are we expecting to find a risen Christ or a dead Christ whose ghost occasionally shows up and harasses us about how we're not good enough or holy enough or giving or merciful or encouraging or sacrificial or knowledgeable enough? Mary walks out of the garden And she walks the streets of Jerusalem with her face pale like she's seen a ghost. And she raps on the door where the disciples are staying and they let her in and they say, what happened to you? Are are you okay? Get her some water. Mary, what happened? And then she utters the most profound words in all of the New Testament. She says, I have seen the Lord. And generation after generation has been making this same confession. I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. I have seen.